for Dawn and for Shirley. And thank you that uh, they are here with us. And we just pray that your spirit will empower Don as he speaks and brings the word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So thanks, Don, for, for coming to us. You didn't have to get in your car at all. You could just stay right where you are. And we don't know if you're in your pajama bottoms. It doesn't really matter to us or anything like that. But uh, we want to welcome you. So, so everyone, let's just welcome Don with... I don't know, thumbs up or a wave. Welcome, Don, everyone. Thank you. We'll turn it over to you, to you Don. Go for it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think I'm unmuted here. Yes, I am. So you're good. It's good to be with you. And uh, this is uh, kind of a stretching experience. I haven't preached on uh, Zoom before. I, last Sunday, I was at Millwoods and they YouTubed me. Uh, but we also had a visible congregation in front, so that helped a lot. But I see your faces on my screen here, so uh, that's good to see so many of you, and uh, thanks so much. It's good to be able to join you. Appreciated uh, Darren and Rhonda leading us in worship. Uh, it comes across very well here on, uh, on Zoom. You did a fine job. I also was uh, quite entertained by the involvement of the children here, both in the story time in the service and in the early session. I was absolutely captivated at how well all these kids were engaged with their teacher. And uh, the teacher, I don't know your name, but you did a fine job in engaging them with your questions. I want to say a long overdue thank you to you as a church as well. Uh, you as a church, uh, as you're aware, we this uh, year were able to purchase the building in Wembley for the All Nations Church Plant. And that came about largely over the initiative of uh, several churches and several individuals who really took the lead in it. And your church was one of them. And I want to say a special thank you. You had, uh, you as a church, got highly involved, but also uh, some of your people took the lead in doing fundraising. As a result, uh, we had raised $250,000 by the time um, we needed to uh, finalize the sale. So we took a mortgage for 150,000. 60,000 has come in after the fact yet. So that we're allowing uh, in discussions with Wembley as to whether they want to put it immediately against principal or use it for some payments as well, how they'll divvy it up. But in the end, it'll all go for purchasing the building. So it leaves about 90,000 left uh, on that building to uh, for it to be fully purchased. But we're so grateful. It was uh, an absolute miracle how that came about. And, uh, but uh, you know, in miracles, God often uses circumstances and people, and he definitely used your church. So I wanna say a very special heartfelt thanks. I wish I could do that in person, but we'll do it on Zoom today. Well, we're here to look at God's word. I got an invitation uh, by email today from another pastor to join them on their Zoom worship service. And, uh, he entitled his, uh, his invite, his inter email invite, a call to worship on a gloomy day. And when I saw it, I thought that's the perfect title actually for, uh, for my message this morning. It's gloomy outside. If you, I don't know what the weather is up in Claremont, but it's pretty gloomy here. We've had an inch and a quarter of rain and it's still raining. And so it's uh, wet and cloudy and gray. It's gloomy that way, but it's also gloomy in many other ways. We've had a lot of change in our lives. We've uh, seen our churches in our districts have to make very quick transitions to try to find a way to minister to their congregations. And of course, now they're having to go the other way. Now, just as you are, we're all trying to figure out how can we regather and when do we regather and what does that look like? 
Uh, we were at Millwoods and about half their congregation gathered last Sunday, but they were all in little groupings of uh, two and four and up to five chairs, family grouping six feet apart across their uh, large sanctuary. And, uh, but it still gave a visible presence of being together, but everyone kept their six feet. So that's kind of interesting. We're trying to navigate how this all goes. But we've also seen other things. We've seen a tremendous change in our economy. Many people with lost jobs, the oil industry is not doing well. And so uh, we certainly have gloomy times. And what do we do when we come to that, these gloomy times? Anne Dillard in, writes in her book, Holy the Firm, why she liked her preacher. She writes, and I quote, there's a church here, only one, so I go to it. On Sunday mornings, I leave the house and I wander down the hill to the white frame church in the firs. On a big Sunday, there might be 20 of us there. Often I'm the only person under 60. The members are of mixed denominations. The minister is a congregationalist and he wears a white shirt. The man knows God. Once in the middle of a long prayer for the whole world, for the gift of wisdom for its leaders, for hope and mercy to the grieving and the pained, for comfort to the oppressed, and for God's grace to all, in the middle of this, he stopped and he burst out. Lord, we bring these same petitions every week. After a shock pause, He continued his prayer. Why does Annie Dillard love her minister? Why does she say, this man knows God? Because she knows his faith has been tested. She says, because of this, I like him very much. You see, his faith is real to Annie Dillard because she knows it's been tested by doubt. Faith never tested by doubt is seen to be kind of unreal. Anyone can believe in a God whose life has been a storybook of happiness. But most see the story as fiction. It's the faith that continues expressing itself even in the midst of doubt that has been exercised by wrestling with the darkness of life and the dilemmas of life, and yet still trusts, still prays, that we say, now that's true. Even God, when he took Abraham, a man known as a man of faith, says in Genesis 2 verse 1, God took and tested Abraham's faith. God wanted to know its authenticity. Well, Habakkuk is all about faith. In fact, the hallmark verse of this book is chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. It's what Paul took in Romans, Romans 1, 16 and 17, as the thesis for his whole letter to the Romans. It's what Martin Luther grabbed as well and began the Reformation with, the just live by faith. And of course, faith that is revealed by faithfulness. Faith has to be tested to be faith at all. Now, Habakkuk was a contemporary of Jeremiah. And he was there just before the Babylonians came and uh, conquered Judah and uh, destroyed the city of Jerusalem ultimately. And uh, so he was waiting. The nation of Judah had fallen into tremendous sinfulness, and he was pained by it. He was a prophet, after all. And uh, he said in chapter 1, he comes to God and he says, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, 
and you don't hear, I cry out to you, violence, yet you don't save. Sounds a lot like what we're seeing in our own nation and south of the border. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists, contention arises. The law is ignored and justice is never upheld. So he's looking at the circumstances around him in the nation of Judah. And he's wondering, he's saying, God, why are you silent? Why haven't you intervened? <coughs> Does our way seem hidden to you? Everything seems unfair. So faith is wondering in chapter one. In chapter two, faith is waiting. I will stand on my guard post, chapter two, verse one, and I'll station myself on the rampart. I'm going to keep watch to see what God will speak to me and how I may reply if he reproves me. And God comes and he actually talks to Habakkuk. And he says, you know what? I'm actually at work, even though it appears I'm doing nothing. Actually, what I'm doing is raising the Babylonians and they're going to come and punish you. And that created more of a dilemma for Habakkuk because he realized the Babylonians weren't even as righteous as the Judeans were. So then he wrestles with God, how can you use a nation more wicked than us to punish us? So he's wrestling with this, but God's saying, you know, you think justice isn't at work? It is at work and I'm at work. You're just not seeing it. We sometimes uh, have the saying, the wheels of justice grind slowly. Sometimes we have to wait a long time, but they are working and they grind exceedingly small. Then he comes to chapter three, and that's the chapter I wanna focus on this morning, where faith is worshiping. It's a prayer actually, or a song, and it's uh, to be sung according to a tempo beat called Shigianoth. And uh, that's an interesting term. It's only used twice in the Bible. One other Psalm has it. And it's a, uh, a term which means it's tremendously dramatic, has tremendous extremes. It's almost like a reel. It can go a tremendously upbeat and then all of a sudden it's like a dirge. So up and down, think of it that way. The ups and downs of life. And life is often shiggy enough, isn't it? It's up and down. One day you're rejoicing, the next day you're in the dumps and you're depressed. So he comes and he worships. And it's a prayer, first of all, for renewal. He said, God, I have heard your report. What had he heard? Well, he had heard that God was actually at work. God was working even if it appeared he was not. And he says, now that I know you're working, I fear because you've told me what you're going to do. And he says, I'm standing in awe of it, but I'm afraid. You know, we're going to be amazed in hindsight of the things that God was doing in our lives and in other people's lives when it appeared he was doing nothing. I think of Joseph in jail. Years of waiting, thinking I'll never get out of this. But God was at work. God was at work changing the situation. During this time of uh, isolation, I read a book called Two Tears on a Window about uh, two people from Edmonton who spent 30 years in China doing all kinds of work, uh, doing uh, charitable work into North Korea, running a restaurant and that in uh, Northern China. And just before they were to come home, they're imprisoned by the Chinese government. I have no idea they're blamed for being uh, 
involved in espionage and all the rest, whatever, trumped up charges. And here they simply sit in prison and wait. They don't get to meet with people, they hear nothing. Finally, there are few things are allowed to out, but they think the Canadian government is doing nothing. And they get upset in the whole time, they get depressed, they're always living right to the very max of what they think they can endure. Finally, the wife is allowed out after about a year, but then she's waiting to get her husband out and seems again, nothing is happening. Finally, after two years, he's allowed out of prison. They have a court, everything, everything seems to be against him. In the Chinese uh, court system, if you come to the place where charges are laid, which had been 99.9% .9 you're guilty. It's already a proven fact just to have the charges laid. And all of a sudden they're free. And they're total shock. And they wonder, how did this happen? Well, obviously there was a lot of things going on behind the scenes that they were never told while they were in prison. And that's the way it often is. God is at work even when we think nothing is happening. But he prays this prayer. He said, revive your work in the midst of the years. What's the midst of the years? Well, in chapter 2, verse 3, Habakkuk had been told, though the vision of what I'm going to do tarries, you're going to have to wait for it. And I want to suggest to you that the midst of the years is that drab flatness of time that is never punctuated by the visible works of God. You ever have those times? Times when life drags on, when your faith sags, when vision fades, because life has taken on a drone because God seems to be at idle. That's the midst of the years. Where God seems to have you on hold. When other people are sharing exciting testimonies, but God seems to be doing nothing for you. Do you know there's an interesting interlude between the Old and the New Testament? There's a gap of 400 years. And we think nothing of it, but it's significant. Because they're known as the silent years. 400 years where no prophet arose, no fresh word from the Lord. And life just dragged on. Think about that. Could you endure 400 years without God ever speaking? With it appearing like God is doing nothing. There's no word. And so Habakkuk says, Lord, in the midst of those years, make your work known. He says, Lord, I'm asking for some glimpse, some confirmation that you are at work, that your plan is progressing, that there are some answers actually on the way. I think of John the Baptist as he languished in prison, Herod's prison, day after boring day, probably almost assured he wouldn't ever get out. He's been so faithful in ministry, but the languishing of time makes him send a messenger to Jesus. Are you really the Lamb of God that I was preaching about? Are you really the Messiah? Give me some fresh glimpse to keep my faith alive. I have a friend, uh, he's very old now, but he was a World War II Lancaster pilot. And he flew many, many missions. Most of the airmen loved to fly with him because he had a reputation for always getting his plane home. 
and as he flew deep into Europe at night and under blackout conditions. I asked him one day, I said, how did you know where you were? And he said, well, you have a compass, you have speed, and you have a clock. And you calculate time by speed, and you plot it on the map by compass. And every once in a while, you would see a light or you'd catch a glimpse by moonlight of a landmark telling where you, where you really were. The rest of the time, you just listen to the drone of the engines. I think that's what Habakkuk is asking. Lord, give me a glimpse of a landmark in the midst of the drone of time. If God is silent, if the answer is going to be a while, Habakkuk says, just give me a glimpse that you are at work so that I keep my faith. I don't need everything. I just need enough to confirm the faith plan. Then his worship continues, though, with remembrance. In chapter 3 to 15, we haven't read that. But if you actually read through it, it's a vivid description of God on the move. It begins, for example, God comes from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens. His earth is full of his praise. Radiance like sunlight, he has rays flashing from his hand. There's no hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence. The plague comes after him. God is on the move. Now, the interesting part about this passage here is that commentators can't agree whether this is past or future. It seems to be a vivid description of God's activity in the past, for example, at Exodus. And yet all the Hebrew language here is mostly in the future, describing what is yet to come. And so is it future or is it past? I want to suggest to you that it might be both. Do you remember the White Queen and Alice in Wonderland who makes the comment it's a very poor memory that only works backwards. You remember that comment? It's a very poor memory that only works backwards. Do you know that the only value of memory really is so that you can project the past forward? That's the value of memory. And so Habakkuk's memory, I think, stretched way back to the Exodus, recalling God's work generations ago for his people. And then his memory could take all those visions of what God had done and project them years ahead and see God doing the same thing or similar things again. That's the value of a memory. And we need to let our memories preach to us. What has God done before? He can do it again. And that's what you have in chapter 3, verse 3 to 15. It's really Habakkuk preaching to himself, the preaching of remembrance. But then he closes now with a prayer in verse 16. I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones in my place. I tremble because I have to wait quietly for the day of distress. God had said, yes, I'm taking the Babylonians and I'm going to defeat Judah by this wicked nation. And now that Habakkuk knows, he says, this terrifies me because all I can do is wait. I have to wait for the people to arise who will invade us. 
I prayed for a renewal of my faith. I preached to myself. But now what? Well, just like many of us who leave on a Sunday morning, you leave knowing that though the sermon maybe spoke and hit the mark, and the prayers were very sincere, you know that life on Monday is going to not be radically different from what it was on Saturday. Habakkuk knew life actually was going to be worse. He was in a waiting game for a Babylonian invasion. Worshiping hadn't told him to praise God from whom all blessings flow. In fact, it had told him praise God when all blessings fail. What were the blessings that were going to fail? Well, the fig tree won't blossom. There'll be no fruit on the vine. Fields will produce no food. Flocks will be cut off from the fold. There'll be no cattle in the stalls. Wow. These are hard times. Put it in your own terms. You worship God today. You pray for a renewal of faith. You're reminded how great God has been in the past. But on Monday, well, the boss may be as difficult as to get along with as he was on Saturday. Maybe if you didn't have a job on Saturday, you may not have a job on Monday. The oil prices may not change. Your stocks may still tank. That chronic sickness won't magically disappear. So why did you worship? Why did you worship if it didn't change? There's a magnificent little book I want to recommend to you. Mr. God, this is Anna. And it's the account of a precocious six-year-old that was reminded of that during these children's times here. Children sometimes say the darndest things, as Art Linkletter used to say. The most amazing things and sometimes have the most amazing insights. And this six-year-old comes to an older man by the name of Finn. Why do we go to church, Finn? Well, he says, to understand Mr. God more. That's how they describe God, Mr. God. And she replies, less. And he comes back, less what? You come to understand Mr. God less. Wait a minute, you flipped. No, I'm not. You most certainly are. No, you go to church to make Mr. God really, really big. And when you make Mr. God really, really, really big, then you really, really don't understand Mr. God. And then you do. Isn't that profound? Do you come to, God, to church on Sunday to understand God? Well, one of the things that you'll do when you understand God is realize that he's so big, you aren't going to understand him. He remains a mystery. And you won't know all about what he's doing. But if he's really, really big, guess what? then you can be sure-footed on the treacherous heights and in the deep valleys. That's what he's saying. I will exalt in the Lord. I will make him really big. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation because if my God is big, then he can be my strength. The Lord is my strength. He's made my feet like hinds feet. He makes me walk on my high places. 
In chapter one, Habakkuk is in a valley. In chapter two, he's on a watchtower. But in chapter three, he's climbing mountains. His faith has grown by seeing God in a strange way, actually being much bigger than he ever thought he was. And he realizes this God can see me through whatever will be ahead. He's not into providing us with an easy street. He's making us sure-footed for the mountain passes. Now, this is a psalm according to Shigianoth. Shigianoth, the dramatic swinging experiences of life, ups and downs, this way and that way. Do you have those? Maybe you're living through them with COVID and all that's happened recently. But when I discover that God is real and that he's at work, even if I don't understand all he is up to, I can become sure-footed in the emotional upheavals of life. He makes me walk even on treacherous places. I trust that that will bless you and see you through in all the experiences we're going through in these times. It's great to be with you today. Thank you so much. Dan. Thanks.